In the last few months, ivermectin has gone from being a little-known anti-parasite drug to a culture war battleground. For some, a potential miracle cure for treating and preventing COVID, and for others, overhyped snake oil. It hit the news again a couple of days ago when one of the most promising and important studies was withdrawn after it was found to be partially plagiarized and that patient records may have been fabricated. So for months, ivermectin has been a flashpoint of the free speech censorship debate, with even Senate testimony from one of its primary advocates, Dr. Pierre Corey, being taken down by YouTube. But the free speech censorship dynamic is only part of the story. It also shows how broken our information landscape is, with the advocates on one side, the skeptics on the other, creating echo chambers and filter bubbles. So much passion and certainty, and yet the two narratives rarely interact. It's the uncanny valley we talked about in our recent newsletter, with big consequences for finding truth. The mainstream largely ignores ivermectin, so the advocates go on alternative shows where they're rarely challenged. And on YouTube, ivermectin becomes a symbol, a rallying cry, and a test of loyalty. So it shouldn't be up to the big tech platforms to decide what people watch. But the marketplace of ideas only works when we're exposed to all of them and they're properly tested and scrutinized. This topic has huge importance. It's life and death. Either a promising and life-saving drug is being deliberately suppressed, or people are being told to take something that doesn't work. I'm a journalist, I'm not a doctor or a scientist, so I'm not equipped to judge the medical claims. But what I can do is to try and find the best and most convincing people on either side and put the best arguments to them and let people judge. The mainstream is still trying to play the old gatekeeping game, which doesn't work. Most ideas should be engaged with, and they're out there anyway, so banning them just means more people become aware of them. But the alternative has its own problems, echo chambers and not being willing to challenge the audience. This is something I'm willing to risk censorship, demonetization over, feature incredible people making arguments that challenge the mainstream alongside the counter-argument and treating them with care and challenge, trying to do actual truth-seeking and journalism. We need to bring the voices together, make sure each of them have a seat at the table, and make sure they're all challenged. The majority of this film will be with Tess Lorry, a doctor and ivermectin campaigner who put together one of the most influential studies in support of the drug and found herself on the other end of censorship. So I've always been a behind the scenes person, but um, now uh, it seems that I'm very controversial. And uh, if I get, uh, if I, or what I'm trying to communicate, which is to help the public educate themselves and be so that they can make informed choices. Um, now I get taken down on YouTube and I've had uh, interviews with uh, Dr. Bean and uh, very respected Dr. John Campbell, and their channels get demonetized if they talk about ivermectin. They get even their channels get taken down. They are medical educators. And I've also got clips and counter arguments from Gideon Marajevic Katz, an Australian researcher who's looked very closely at the data. The one thing I would say is that I'm personally very open to ivermectin having a benefit. I, as I've said, on all of my blogs on the topic and all of my articles on the topic, uh, I would love it if ivermectin was 100% effective at treating COVID and preventing it. It would prevent deaths from COVID. And also, I mean, frankly, I've had family members pass away due to COVID. Um, I know several people who've been very sick. It would be fantastic if we had a drug that was as effective as some people believe ivermectin to be. I just don't think that the evidence currently supports the position that it is. Maybe in the future we will have evidence that, that it, it is a, ma a miracle, life-saving drug. Um, who knows? And also Graham Walker, an emergency doctor from San Francisco, who's also been digging deeply into the ivermectin story and advocates like Pierre Corey. I certainly believe that he's, he is, um, his heart is in the right place, but I, I feel like he believes the observational evidence way too strongly um, and I do, I guess I do get the sense that, um, that he, um, feels like he's speaking for like a large portion of doctors. And I just don't like that. He's representing that he's kind of maybe either speaking the truth that like the rest of us 
have been silenced or we don't feel um, safe speaking up or something like that. And that's just not true. Like if you look at Twitter, um, I mean, there's thousands of doctors that will talk to you about ivermectin and, and not be supportive of ivermectin. His interpretation of the evidence um, is that we have sufficient evidence to act right now. And uh, I would say the vast majority of physicians um, feel like that is nowhere near the case and that there are many more ICU doctors that would actually disagree with him. I've also messaged Pierre Corey on multiple occasions to take part, but got no response this time. So I hope you enjoy this film, and we'll be hosting a sense-making conversation in our digital campfire on Tuesday. So if you're a member, come along to that, or consider joining up, and hope to see you soon. So Tess, thank you so much for joining me. You're the leader of the Bird Group, which is one of the main uh, groups advocating for the use of ivermectin. And you've obviously been interested in this for, for a while now. You've put together one of the more influential meta-studies, which is a combination of all the different studies that have been produced. And I think it's right in saying that you are concentrating mainly on the randomized control trials, the most high-profile, high-quality data. And you've got a, um, so I'd love to, to know a little bit, like, how did you first become interested in this? And what's your background in a, in a fairly concise way? Yes. Um, well, I'm a medical doctor and a researcher. And I have a company called the Evidence-Based Medicine Consultancy. It's a limited company, but we only work for nonprofit organizations. And our work is mainly synthesizing evidence to support clinical practice guidelines. So I work as an external consultant for the World Health Organization and have done since 2012. And I'm also an honorary researcher at the Royal United Hospital in Bath in the UK, also since about, uh, I think, 2011. I first became interested in ivermectin in December, and it wasn't, uh, it hasn't been a commissioned job with, um, with the World Health Organization. It was purely after seeing Dr. Pierre Corey's appeal before the state Senate in, um, in the U.S. begging to be able to use ivermectin or that it should be used more widely. And, um, you know, this piqued my curiosity as well as, uh, as a sense of being able to help because I thought what I do is evidence synthesis and if I can assess it and it, and I, and it agrees with um, Pierre Corey, uh, then I, I, World Health Organization listens to my work and I should be able to provide them the evidence and they can expedite uh, uh, approval of it. Hmm. And I, I'm really interested in this, this topic for a few different reasons, one of which these are clearly matters of life and death. They're, they're hugely consequential to everyone in the middle of a pandemic. So I think the, the sense of responsibility on all of us who are looking at this, I think, is really, is really keen and, and, and key. And the other issue, as I know you're familiar with our work with Daniel Schmachtenberger, for example, talking about the information ecology and the difficulty of making sense and the fact that so much of the, the information landscape seems corrupted and weaponized and so much kind of polarization um, that that's the other interesting thing for me is like this this level of um, passion and what seems to me to be very isolated bubbles where what is considered true on one side is considered obviously false on the other what is considered obviously false on the other side is considered obviously true what do you make of, of that like the the passion and the the kind of narrative warfare, I guess, that's going on around this topic? It is very, very surprising that you have this, you know, either or, that you either for vaccination or you're against it. You know, you, you, there doesn't seem to be any middle ground. Doctors need treatments in their tool kit. You know, you can't just use vaccinations. People get sick and they still need to be treated. So this idea that we, you know, we we're not allowed to use common sense and use our safe old medicines um, and that they all have to go through large randomized controlled trials is absurd in the context of a pandemic where we need to be able to react quickly. And in actual fact, doctors always look in their toolbox to see what they've got that can be repurposed in the case of something new. So in my opinion, you actually cannot make sense of the world at the moment without talking about ivermectin, because ivermectin is a key to unraveling a, a lot of, um, uh, I think, 
uh, unraveling a lot of what's gone on in the last year that we haven't quite understood. And uh, just to sort of speak to something you just said, something I've heard from a lot of medical people I've spoken to is that there has been this kind of singular focus on vaccines and there hasn't been very much research or there's been, uh, a, yeah, there hasn't been as much research on small molecules, on repurposed drugs. And I know ivermectin is one, but I think there are other drugs that people are also looking at at the moment as well. Uh, I spoke to Andrew Hill and he mentioned four, I think, that were being looked at. If I could just say, it's not as if there hasn't been much re research done on the uh, on on repurposing. There's a massive, massive amount of research done on repurposed medicines from countries that uh, that use these medicines routinely, and they have them because they know they don't they don't they can't afford expensive molecules. They've got to look at what, what they use. So, in the review that we did on ivermectin, there were 24 randomized controlled trials, and they've been conducted in 15 countries, not the UK or the USA or the countries that are really focusing on novel treatments and 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 these new molecules. Um, but uh, but countries where they they really had to uh, think quickly about what they had and and could be repurposed. So it's certainly not true to say that uh, that there hasn't been research done on repurposing. It just hasn't been done in the UK. Mm. And your the reason we're talking now is um, I think something called World Ivermectin Day, which is happening on Saturday. Uh, probably when this film goes out. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? What's the idea behind that? Yes. Well, um, you mentioned the British Ivermectin Recommendation Development Group. So this was a group established in February, and uh, it was established by a group of UK doctors, but it in included many, many doctors from around the world and health, um, allied health professionals and scientists. And at that meeting, it was decided that the evidence was judged to be sufficient for ivermectin to be recommended for both prevention and treatment of COVID. And so we have been um, trying to disseminate this message for some months now and have uh, and now have on board many, many affiliate uh, ethical doctors groups from around the world. And so World Ivermectin Day is something that we've planned to raise awareness very quickly because we can see that... Um, there's a lot of censorship around ivermectin and it's really to get this positive message out to the public as quickly and efficiently as possible that COVID is treatable, not to be feared. There's a whole range of generic medicines and supplements that can and should be used and ivermectin is top of the list uh, in, in any treatment plan for COVID. Graham, welcome. Would you be able to introduce yourself, who you are and um, what your background is? Yeah, sure. Thanks, David. Uh, I'm an emergency physician in San Francisco, California. Uh, and, you know, I am passionate about evidence and evidence medicine. And uh, I kind of got wrapped up in um, uh, kind of COVID and vaccination and anti-vaccination and uh, ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, mostly through, honestly, through social media and seeing so much misinformation and disinformation online and felt like I wanted to have some way of kind of contributing more than just seeing patients in the ER. Obviously, I can't see every single patient with COVID in the ER. And I got honestly kind of frustrated with trying my best and feeling like I was, you know, in during COVID sacrificing a lot um, to try to keep myself and my family safe. Um, and it was scary and felt like I, I had to be able to do more um, than just kind of one on one stuff. And so just started um, uh, reading more and using my training um, as a as a physician to try to uh, uh, provide actual reasonable information to people, because I know people were scared and unsure and, and just knowing that social media allows kind of incorrect information to often spread faster than accurate information as well. There's lots of studies on that, too. So um, yeah, that, that's how I got involved, just wanting to try to answer people's questions and provide information to people when there's so much um, kind of disinformation out there already. And how deeply has, have you delved into the data and what have you found by doing that? 
So most of my time I've, I've spent trying to answer people's questions and people have had a lot of questions about ivermectin specifically. And because of that, I've spent uh, probably, probably 30 or 40 hours at least um, reading the uh, meta-analyses from Tess Lorry and from the FLCCC group, the, the Pierre Corey um, group. Uh, and then because they, and then like uh, the C19ivermectin.com or whatever, um, because those meta-analyses seem resoundingly positive and almost unbelievably positive, I've gone and like, okay, this seems, this is weird. It, like it, it kind of sets off my spidey sense. Um, that just, it doesn't seem right uh, to me because there's few drugs that kind of check all those boxes off and the, the data is mostly observational and it's low quality. So then I've thought, like I've legitimately tried to keep an open mind and thought, um, okay, like um, maybe they're right. Maybe, like maybe this is a wonder drug. Like am, am I wrong in being so uh, questioning of it? Um, maybe they're onto something because I mean that's how some discoveries get made. Like people, you know, you know, it's it's possible. I, and I and I I would lo like I said, like there's a there's a wonder and like I would love for this to work. So you know I'm like okay, well, let me go go back and look at the primary literature. And when I've gone through and read, certainly not every one of the sixty plus studies, but um, primarily the larger and um, uh, either the more popular ones or the uh, certainly the double-blind randomized controlled trials, which are kind of our highest level of um, individual trial evidence. Um, not only are there lots of problems I've seen with those studies um, that, that just don't, we, we wouldn't accept in any other part of medicine. We'd say, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't make decisions that impact patients based on this low quality trial. Um, but, you know, they like, mix dosages together and mix different groups of people together. And there's a general sense, I think, that like a meta-analysis can, like I think I saw Brett Weinstein today even saying, um, you know, a, a meta-analysis can address any issues with uh, with low quality trials. And it, it, it doesn't work that way. It's garbage in, garbage out. Um, you can't take really poor quality data um, uh, from a poor quality study and add that all together and make good quality data. Uh, if there's problems with the way you, um, inherent flaws with the way you study something, you can't get rid of those inherent flaws by doing a meta-analysis, combining a bunch of, you know, low quality studies together. I, I guess the, the difficult thing for people outside the conversation to judge is what the, what the, the level of consensus or the level of kind of agreement among doctors might be. Um, so I, I, I've spoken to a few different doctors over the last um, week or so. And I'd say, I'd say quite, quite a few of them were, had read a lot of the primary literature on ivermectin. They'd read many of the studies and, and their, their conclusion, as far as I can tell, their very good faith was they they felt like a lot of the studies were very small. The evidence that they wouldn't they wouldn't be confident recommending a different drug, not just ivermectin, but a different drug in their practices if it had the same evidence base. David, my team's job is to evaluate bodies of evidence and make uh, uh, and to provide these bodies of evidence and guide decision making on recommendations. We do this routinely. I'm doing it now for the World Health Organization on a different project. So for individual doctors who are not familiar with evidence synthesis to read an individual paper and say, or, you know, or to read even the newspapers saying there's insufficient evidence it is, you know, really, this is a time where you need to look at the experts for guidance. And there are clinical experts who are making recommendations on treatment protocols and they're saving thousands of lives. And there are scientific experts and research expert teams who are independent and objective and, uh, and are doing our jobs to provide the evidence and guidance at this time. And what evidence would persuade you that ivermectin didn't work? <laughs> uh, 
Ivermectin works. <laughs> There's nothing that would persuade me. You know, I mean, how much more proof does one need? It's two billion people. You know, it's like the world's best kept secret. Two billion people know about it. Uh, it works. And I've spoken to, I've been looking to it quite a bit over the last few days, obviously not as much as, as you, but I'd like to kind of put some of the counterpoints or counter arguments. So recently there was a lot of um, focus on the El Ghazar study in Egypt that was withdrawn after there were, there were allegations that a lot of the patient records looked like they've been duplicated or falsified, that some of the... Um, the intro or some of the, the work on it was plagiarized as well. Um, what did you make of that? Well, we, you know, we were aware we've, we've, now that these allegations have been made, we have responded by removing al from the meta-analysis and recalculating, which shows still clearly that ivermectin works. If you just look at the randomized controlled trial evidence, which we did. So we've submitted a letter to the American Journal of Therapeutics explaining this, and, uh, and hopefully that will be published shortly. Um, you know, with regard to Professor al -Ghazar, I don't want to judge him at this stage just based on a news report. He's obviously got his, own, his uh, reputation at stake, and I think he deserves the opportunity to respond um, in due course. Gideon, welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself and let us know who you are and, and what your role is? Hi, yeah, I I'm Gideon Maravitz Katz. Uh, I'm a researcher and an epidemiologist from the University of Wollongong. And I guess uh, I have been involved with this uh, somewhat by association in, in terms of ivermectin. Um, mostly I've been involved with COVID-19 from the perspective of researching the death rates, the IFR particularly, and more recently kind of the, the impact of lockdowns. Uh, we just published a paper on, on that. Um, but in this case, uh, I, I've also been involved with looking over error checking in science um, throughout the pandemic. And particularly with ivermectin, I was contacted uh, by um, a master's student from England, Jack Lawrence, who, said, who sent me a paper that I'd previously commented on, pointing out some, I guess, inconsistencies with, with uh, published research. And um, Jack sent me the paper and said, I think there are more significant issues. Would you be interested in, in having a look? And so I did. And um, I guess... My, my role in actually finding the uh, the potential issues with the paper itself was relatively minor because Jack had already picked it all up. He just wanted a, a couple of people to look over it and, and confirm that. Uh, what I then looked at was what impact does this have on the literature as a whole? If you take published meta-analyses, which are, I guess, scientific aggregations of evidence, you take out this paper, what does that mean for the evidence on ivermectin for COVID-19, and particularly the impact on mortality, which I guess is why it's been in the news so much recently. Could you, could you summarize what you mean by that, that there was one specific paper that, that you had concerns with, that was the one that was skewing the results, mostly in terms of the death rate, and if you took it out, it changed the, it changed the, the profile for the drug? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so... Um... Basically, the way that meta-analyses work, um, they're, they're aggregations of evidence. You put in a number of trials and you get out, uh, I guess, a more consistent result. Um, the, the way that the statistical formulae work, and I, I mean just generally, they um, are heavily influenced by larger studies that also uh, have very positive or very negative results. Um, so the, the, the bit broader the result and, and, and the... Um, the bigger the study tends to have a bigger influence on, on how that point estimate moves. And in this case, um, the study in question, which was uh, by El Ghazar et al, um, uh, pre-printed on Research Square, um, which has now been retracted, uh, has a very large impact on the literature because the study implied a 90% benefit for ivermectin on mortality. So that it's huge. I mean, I've, I've, had a look, and as far as I can see, the last time we found uh, a benefit of 90% on any virus for any drug was in people dying of AIDS uh, for antiretroviral medication. So it's huge. And in this case, um, 
basically the, the survival benefit or the mortality benefit for ivermectin, when you look at the, the evidence published in these meta-analyses that have found positive results, comes from two studies. Now, but a lot of that is from this one study called El, from, by El Ghazar et al. And then the other one is a fairly high risk of bias study um, that found a much smaller uh, risk, uh, sorry, a much smaller mortality benefit. And what happens if you rerun the meta-analytic models, I use Starter, so I reran these in Starter 15, um, and you exclude just the El Ghazar uh, study, because as I said, it was the biggest study to date on ivermectin, the biggest randomized control trial, sorry. There have been observational trials, but these, these meta-analyses look at randomized control trials because they're the gold standard in evidence. If you exclude this one study, you find that either the benefit uh, becomes non-significant or it becomes very marginally significant statistically. So your confidence interval go if prior to excluding the study, um, to take the Bryant et al. meta-analysis, they found a huge mortality benefit that was wildly statistically significant. So it, I believe it was a 62% uh, mortality benefit, and the confidence interval from that ran from about 30% benefit to about a 90% benefit. So huge, right, and, and very significant. If you exclude the Algazar study, just that study from the meta-analysis, you find that the confidence interval uh, either crosses one, so includes harm, or just just misses one. So it um, reduces the, the benefit to about 44% from 62% and reduces the, and, and widens the confidence interval to the point where it, or it almost suggests no benefit at all. And then the problem becomes that any survival benefit you see in this meta-analytic model comes purely from this one other study by um, Niai et al. from Iran. And that study is at very high risk of bias. So it's a challenge because while you could argue that there is still a statistically significant result depending on how you run the model, depending on how you weight your studies, it then comes back to one study which is at huge risk of bias. If you exclude that study... All the studies are pretty consistent that there's no mortality benefit for ivermectin in these randomized controlled trials that have been published so far. So the counter argument to that would be, but there are plenty of observational trials. There are lot, there is lots of other evidence that shows that ivermectin is incredibly useful. Um, so the randomized control trials are a red herring. Yes. And... I'm not uh, arguing that there are observational trials that have shown uh, benefit. The challenge is that observational trials, particularly with such uh, complex and challenging exposures, um, and COVID is, is pretty complex, um, they, they don't give you a very good picture of whether drugs actually work. Um, a good example of this is hydroxychloroquine, because hydroxychloroquine had a huge number of observational trials suggesting a benefit, and then we ran randomized controlled trials, and they found initially that there was no benefit, and now actually that the most recent gold standard meta-analysis suggests that hydroxychloroquine increases the risk of death when given to people who have mild, moderate, or severe COVID. So the challenge is if you rely on observational evidence for drugs, for, for your efficacy estimates, it can be very misleading and potentially completely misleading. And in this case, if we have randomized trials, um, they would be the gold standard of evidence. And the, currently, it is very hard to come to a conclusion based on the RCTs, because once you exclude one or two trials, the benefit doesn't appear to be there for mortality. Yeah, and obviously these are very, we're getting into sort of data analysis and a lot of these very complicated topics, which is, is difficult for, for most people to understand if they don't have the scientific background. Um, but I also look at, for example, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of Gideon Meyerowitz Katz, who's been quite active on Twitter. He's a data scientist in Australia who also says that with it, when El Ghazar is taken out, a lot of the benefit for mortality rests on the Iranian study, NI, 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 and there have been concerns about that study. Like These are obviously conversations that I think need to be had between scientists. 
But what, what's your response to that? It's, it's very unfortunate that there, there are these singular voices who are um, almost um, insisting on, on discrediting this old medicine. So it's ivermectin's used billions of times. It has been used billions of times. It's used now amongst millions of people for COVID. Doctors are using it. So, you know, it's kind of a moot point to have a journalist or whoever it is on Twitter saying um, that ivermectin, uh, you know, that he has concerns about this study and that study. We have evidence. I think what people don't understand is it's not just evidence from randomized control trials that we are looking at with ivermectin. With established medicines, we have this massive pyramid that's populated at every level uh, of evidence. So we have systematic reviews and meta-analyses. We have randomized control trials. We have a huge body of observational data. I mean, there's studies that include thousands of healthcare workers, uh, you know, that have shown significant benefit uh, with regard to using ivermectin for prevention, preventing COVID. Um, there's there's thousands that have, uh, for, of uh, observational studies that are that are not randomized control trials that show ivermectin works for tr uh, treatment at all stages. There's country case studies where ivermectin has been employed, India, for example, in Mexico, where you see quite clearly as soon as ivermectin is employed, the COVID rates drop off in COVID deaths. And you only have to look at the, you know, the, the deaths per million in the UK and, and the USA to see that in actual fact, we've got the worst, the developed world's got the worst stats and deaths for COVID than anywhere. Um, you know, these countries like India, for example, that were so highlighted in the news, their COVID deaths are about 300 per million. In the UK, it's 2,000 per million, more or less. So, you know, I'd rather follow the, the Indian protocols because they seem to be doing something right. They're treating patients with COVID. They're not waiting for them to turn blue. And there's lots of other evidence from around the world, like showing, showing ivermectin introduced, showing death rates going down in various countries. Um, India, for example, is mentioned. Some other kind of places are, are mentioned. Are you not persuaded by that data? Um, I always find analyses like that kind of strange. So take India, for example. The, the death toll in India is now demonstrably undercounted. Um, the estimates, that there's just been a paper published that I read they, where they use different ways of estimating the true toll of COVID. So the official toll is about 400,000 deaths, I believe. Um, they estimated that somewhere between 2.5 and 4.5 million people in India have died from COVID-19. Um, so if ivermectin had this 100% mortality benefit, you would not expect that to be true. You would not expect that they've had a death toll that currently equals the global official death toll um, just in one, one very large country. Uh, it's also worth noting that that sort of evidence, you know, it, it, pyramids of evidence are misleading, but they are useful as a metaphor. So you've got kind of meta-analyses of randomized trials at the top, and then you slowly work your way down to less and less robust uh, evidence. And when you're, coming, when you're talking about, well, more people have died in this country that in theory used more ivermectin compared to this country that in theory didn't, I mean, you haven't measured how many people took ivermectin in, in each place. You haven't measured uh, how many people have died in, in an effective way. So it, it's just hard to take any meaning from that sort of analysis. And you're talking about it being used as a prophylactic, as a prevention there, which is one of the claims made about it. And I've heard Brett Weinstein talk about that ivermectin is close to 100% effective at preventing COVID. And from what I can tell, that seems mostly derived from one single study in Argentina, the Carvalho study that a lot of people have talked about. Have you read that? Are you aware of that? I have. Uh, you know, it shows a lot of correlation. And, you know, it's interesting that, um, that they talk so much about it being an ivermectin study. It's actually not an ivermectin study. It's an ivermectin plus um, car cartagen uh, yeah, um, so it's a study of those two um, things combined uh, with um, in in healthcare workers in in uh, Argentina, um, and there's a couple. Uh, there's lots of issues with it. The ones that that come to mind right now, um, 
So they they saw in a smaller group of people they they um, saw evidence that this this cocktail was highly effective, and so then they did it in another group of people, but they changed the dosing. You can't really do that um, because it, it changes what you're studying. Um, so you can't uh, you know you couldn't say. Um, hey, David, I'm going to give you an apple and an orange every single day, and we're going to see what happens to your vitamin C levels um, over the next month. And then we say, oh, my gosh, David's vitamin C levels went up. Okay, let's try this in David and Graham. Well, let's change it and have Graham do two, two oranges and one apple. That's a different study, right? So you can't change the dosaging um, or you can't really change anything about the trial halfway through the trial and then combine those two groups. So that's one thing. The second thing is, you know, it's a study of two, two medicines, not, um, not one. How, like, how do we know that it wasn't the, the other substance that was helpful or the two of them combined? There's literally no way to know that. And then the, the third thing that just doesn't ring true to me in that trial is I, I think that's the trial where there were like zero cases of um, of COVID in the arm that got the treatment and uh, a very high percentage of COVID cases in the other arm, that, that, that just doesn't happen in medicine. I mean, even in, in the best, um, the most effective drugs that we have, like the randomness of nature and the imperfection of you know, humanity makes it so that um, nothing, no trials ever end up that way. Like even in the, even in the COVID vaccine trials, um, some people in the vaccine arm got COVID. Now, wh whether that's because those people had a genetic abnormality that made them more prone to getting COVID or um, they waited too long to get their second dose or their kid got COVID. So they were living, you know, somebody, the kid was coughing in their face every single day. We don't know why, but in, co in the COVID vaccine trials, in like trials of defibrillators for somebody that's had a cardiac arrest, in, er in pretty much every trial, the good outcome or the bad outcome or the outcome of interest happens in both groups. It just happens hopefully less in the group that you're, that you're hoping it to, to happen in. So the fact that like zero people out of, I think like 700 got COVID and in the other arm, like... I don't know, was it like 500 of the 700 in the other arm got COVID? That, that just seems, um, I never in, in medicine have I seen a study um, with that big of a difference between, between groups of people, right? I mean, we think that like, um, you know, oh, you get pneumonia, we give you antibiotics and it helps every single person with, with pneumonia. And that, that's just not how it works. It, it helps most people, um, but it doesn't help every single person, um, even in even in a trial of antibiotics for pneumonia, right? So some people, even getting antibiotics, are going to get worse and you know need to go to the ICU. They're going to need another course of antibiotics. The pneumonia is going to turn into an abscess. Like There's always fallouts on both sides of the control group and the experimental group. And so just like the fact that they, like, literally it was zero, like not a single person in 700 people got COVID either. That to me says it's it's got to be one of two things. Ivermectin truly is, as as they are promoting it, an incredible magic wonder drug, which uh, of which, um, you know, we've we found almost, I, I can't think of any that are that good um, at saving lives. Um or there's a problem with the study or the reporting or the data. There's some problem, right, in the system somewhere um, with the data. Like there's just, there's so many examples of medicine, of literally like miracle medicines that are incredible at saving people's lives. Um, Gleevec for, um, for leukemia, like literally a transformational, um, melted away cancers in people. And still in the people that got Gleevec, not the placebo, still like some people didn't get better. Because, like that, like that's just medicine. It's not fair. We don't want. We wish it was different, but that's that's how it works. Mm. Yeah, even the idea of human error that people may forget to take the tablets or some other some other reason would you would imagine that there would be some cases. Yeah, whether it's genetics, you know, nature or nurture, there's always some. Um, there's usually some reason that. Um, that a medicine, you know, fails to work, even though it's supposed to. Oh, it worked in all these other nine people. Why didn't it work in this one person? It's hard to know, you know. You mentioned the Carvalho, stu Carvalho study in Argentina, which is the, 
the famous one that Pierre Corey's mentioned quite a few times, um, an, an awful lot of healthcare workers. And in the, the ivermectin group, zero got COVID and then something like over half got COVID in the control group that weren't taking ivermectin. Ivermectin and carrageenan, I think, is the was actually the drug in that yes, trial. Yes, they use carrageenan in, in uh, South America too, which is a uh, spray, I think, a plant-based. Yeah, it's carrageenan, I think it's a seaweed uh, derivative. Um, so I'd love to get your response to this because another of the doctors I was speaking to said his concern with that study is that there's almost no intervention in medicine that's 100 percent so he and he immediately had concerns over that study because even if people forget to take their pills or you just get some people who don't um, who fall out of the, the study or for some reason the drug doesn't work the same way on them even the best drugs we have tend to be sort of 90 percent effective even the wonder drugs we have like the antivirals for hiv are only 90 percent effective so I think a lot of that was a sense I got from quite a lot of the medical people I spoke to that that study to them felt something was was off about it. Well, Professor Cavallo, I'm sure I'd be really happy to meet with you and have a discussion about that. I'm certainly not going to, you know, um, uh, I, I don't wish to to judge his his work. You know, I think he's a very credible scientist and doctor and believe he's saving many, many lives. Sure, and I, I don't think I or they would be commenting on his integrity or anything like that. It's we we all know there are there are some like scientific trials are designed to to get rid of bias, and some scientific trials fail for all sorts of different reasons. Do you do you understand why someone might look at that and think that doesn't make sense? Yes, yes, I do. I I, I see there was an an actual fact. Um, you know the fact that there there are naught. I suppose uh, it is intriguing and uh, and could be followed up with him. Um, you know, so that's one study. There are others. There's an uh, Indian study uh, by Dr. Bahira. Um, I think the point is uh, there seems to be this intense scrutiny. It's almost sort of we seem to be getting lost in, in a haystack uh, looking for the perfect trial. And in actual fact, I don't believe a perfect trial exists when there's actually a mountain of evidence in favor of ivermectin, when you just step back and look at it all and use your common sense and say all of these doctors, all of these scientists, you know, cannot be wrong and, and they're in the field. You know, I think that's what's really interesting about these studies is they're in the field. They may not be perfectly designed and, and hugely funded with the billions that go with, with these novel treatments, but they are coming from doctors in the field who are uh, who are doing their best to do the research and to save lives at the same time? Mm. Yeah, and I appreciate your um, yeah the nuance in your answer there. My comment, I guess, about the um, so I understand this sort of sense that maybe people are nitpicking or they're they're kind of looking intensely at certain things and but I think the focus on the Carvalho study in particular is because some people have been making claims like we know ivermectin is something like 100% effective as a prophylactic. And as far as I can tell, that's almost entirely based on this, this one study. So it's not just the people on the other side who are using that as there seems to be a lot. What I'm saying is there's a lot of weight being put on that study on, on both sides of the argument. Yes, I think, you know, as a just if I was a member of the public, I would uh... I would start engaging in these matters that affect my health and stop outsourcing to governments and agencies that might not be looking at you as an individual and thinking about what's right for you. The, uh, there is, it's a matter of fact that doctors and scientists are, and experts are being systematically censored if they speak about ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine and I think we need to be asking why. Why we need to be asking why is there no open discussion about early treatment for COVID? Why are people being told 
there's only mass vaccination and there's no hope for early treatments with COVID until these novel molecules from the big pharma are approved and expedited through emergency use authorization. What what about the evidence for ivermectin as a prophylactic, as a prevention? What does that? What's your view on that? Looking at the data, I think um, that is a much more challenging thing to assess. There are far fewer studies that have really um, been conducted looking at ivermectin as a prophylactic. There, you know, there there are these weird online aggregations of evidence, as IV, IVN Meta or something, um, that that just. Um, aggregate completely wildly divergent studies. But when you actually look at the literature, it's, it's very hard to run a study of prophylaxis. So fewer people have done it. And I think um, potentially there's, there's some benefit there, but it's very hard to tell. I think at the moment there are only two randomized control trials um, or three, sorry, three randomized control trials. One of which uh, is, is the study that I just mentioned that, um, <laughs> that has impossible values in its table of results. So yeah, when I say, uh, I, I really don't know. I think it's fair to say that the literature is not in a, a sufficiently robust place to make a, a strong assessment. And that's actually an, also a conversation I had with Andrew Hill. Um, it, it's just hard to tell. I mean, I think that the a couple of the studies on prophylaxis have been pretty good, uh, and they have shown some benefit in terms of um, reduction in infections. But given the small numbers, the relatively small numbers, uh, yeah, hard to tell. You need really big numbers to run a good trial on prophylaxis. That's part of the problem. Because the argument that's being made at the moment, and I've heard people say, we have evidence that that ivermectin is 100% effective at prophylaxis, and therefore uh, people being advised or encouraged to take it in lieu of vaccination. Do you think that the data is there for that kind of assertion? Absolutely not. Uh, no, that, that, that is a wild thing to say, I think. Um, nothing is 100%. Uh, I mean, it's statistically unlikely, but also I don't think we've ever found anything that's 100% effective. You know, as I said, uh, treating people dying of AIDS with antiretroviral medications it doesn't prevent 100% of deaths. Um, and that's like a slam dunk, fantastic result. Giving someone antibiotics with an antibiotic uh, with a uh, bacterial infection is also similarly. So 100% it sounds unlikely. Have you been censored in... Obviously, Pierre Corey has had even his Senate testimony taken down. Um, have, have you found yourself being censored on this topic? I have been censored widely. In, in January, I put my first ever public um, uh, expression on social media... Um, it received 2,000 views and then was taken down. It was uh, an appeal to the Prime Minister to please look at ivermectin and approve it immediately. Um, so I've always been a behind-the-scenes person. But um, now uh, it seems that I'm very controversial. And uh, if I get, uh, if I, or what I'm trying to communicate, which is to help the public educate themselves, and be so that they can make informed choices. Um, now I get taken down on YouTube and I've had uh, interviews with uh, Dr. Bean and uh, very respected Dr. John Campbell and their channels get demonetized if they talk about ivermectin. They get, even their channels get taken down. They are medical educators. Um, I've had my Vimeo account, which is a paid for account, removed just putting up an educational video. Um, I've had um, my Twitter account removed. Um, I, any posts about me on Facebook get taken down. I don't have a Facebook account and I never, well, I, I never really used one. Um, but um, so, you know, I've never been really on social media much. I never really thought I was had a, had a controversial message to convey. I just want to save lives help people educate themselves about their options. And, and uh, you know, I thought that would take two weeks and I could get back to my regular work, but it's been, you know, quite a, an ongoing, it's been quite a marathon. Mm. And how has that been for you? How, how has that, that felt being in the middle of that? Well, I've been very, very supported. I feel very blessed in a way to have this positive message to share 
and and very supported now you know we've got so many international affiliates of ethical doctors organizations who are all united really in this effort to provide an alternative narrative to the the authorities um and we don't know why they are restricting access uh, to doctors and the public, but um, but we do know that we need to unite and provide an alternative voice, so that you know, so that um, the public feel supported. It's very confusing as a member of the public at this point, I think, to to know what to do. But um, you know, I just uh, I would just like to assure everybody that we as doctors have your back and we are doing our very best to get the information that you need. Mm. Yeah, and I'd like to come to the the kind of suppression of the message in a second. But just to say that my one, one of the big concerns that I have as a, as a journalist, I'm obviously not a, a medical expert, um, but as a journalist, my huge concern is that we seem to have a really broken marketplace of ideas where the mainstream is protected from anything that challenges certain narratives and won't engage with it and won't won't host conversations with people for example promoting ivermectin because they don't want to give false equivalents and they're going with um, what they consider to be sort of medical consensus and then on the alternative i i don't see those ideas being challenged. Like I, I feel in, a, in, a, in the Facebook groups that I'm part of and in the communities I'm part of, I'd say that the, the narrative around ivermectin is almost dominant. Like there's a lot of knowledge around it. There's a lot of information around it, but ju I just don't see those narratives meeting. And that seems incredibly unhealthy on both sides because that's not how science works. It's not how truth seeking works. I mean, you have a highly intelligent audience. Do they need to be protected from information on ivermectin from doctors like me? No, no. I mean, I've I've spoken out very clearly that the big tech platforms are not should not be the ones making these judgments. I do think there is another another issue that the the narrative we just have these ecosystems where certain narratives become completely unchallenged. And obviously, we, we have a mainstream ecosystem where narratives are not challenged in an adequate way as well. And I, I see this complete splintering of, so that's what I'm trying to do with this piece in particular, is how can we bring the narratives together? How can we challenge people on, on each side and, and, and have these good faith conversations? Are you aware of the Trusted News Initiative? Yes, I'm familiar with it. Well, they got together in uh, December and decided to protect people from harmful disinformation, misinformation on vaccines. Now, the groups involved are regular news, respected news authorities like Reuters, API, BBC and others, okay. And uh, they're the news initiatives, but they're also social media. So Microsoft, Google uh, and other big tech so you have a partnership here between our trusted media and private industry. Do you think that that is uh, a good idea? I can see why people are very suspicious of it. I think they're responding to a genuine deeper problem, which is the effect that the, the social media platforms have had on the, have had on the landscape of finding truth. Do you, I mean, let, 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 me, let, me, let me ask a counterpoint, Tess, because I think this is, do you think that there are some medical claims that are made, let's just say miracle cures, like I've, I've uncovered, there's a, there's a Facebook groups where people recommend giving their kids bleach to treat them of autism, and when they come out in rashes, and when they start having all of these kind of side effects, they say, no, that's, you're just shedding toxins, that's all that's going on. So... I mean, the, the counter question is, do you think that there are some medical claims or there are some issues that require the big tech platforms or someone to take action to against that misinformation? 
I think we can all make up our own minds. We are not a Facebook group. We are a bunch of scientists. Sure, but, but my, 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 point is, my point is, do you think that, I, I agree with you that the line is being drawn in the wrong place. But my question is, do you think that there is a line? I don't think there should be a line. I don't think there should be censorship because... I Even if people are recommending, saying, you need to feed your kids bleach, and we know that people are actually doing it, we don't, you don't think that should be suppressed? You think that, that you're that much of a free speech absolutist? Who are going to be the gatekeepers? Who are going to be the censors? These, these are all very valid questions, Tess, and I completely agree. Um, like we don't trust any, we don't trust anyone to make those decisions. I, I completely agree with that. But yeah. this is one of the biggest questions, and one I wrestle with a lot. And I don't think we can even agree at, at, as a wider society. I think I, I think you can make a very strong argument that we should have some process, some independent body, or something that is able to say, okay, this is beyond the pale. For an example like that, which is like. There are people encouraging people to take bleach. There are people selling cancer miracle cures that some desperate people will always will always sign up for. I, I think there's a strong case to be made that that there should be rules against that. But we don't trust anyone to draw those lines. That's that's the deeper question, I think. Yeah, I don't think uh, human beings or AI can be trusted to to when it comes to making the judgments with regard to censorship. So I think. I, I agree with you that, that, I mean, a lot of our content, you know, you've watched Rebel Wisdom for a long time. We've been very clear on, look, we're, the big tech platforms are putting themselves in this position where they're the arbiters of truth. They're, they, they were not elected to this. They're, we've got private companies owning the public spare, square. It's, it's diabolical. They are keeping out all of the heterodox ideas that we need to reinvent ourselves and we need a healthy information landscape and we need to have these conversations. I guess the, I, I just, my, my feeling is it's very, very complex. And I, I do see some cases where a line does need to be drawn, but none of us trust the people who might be in that position to draw those lines. And the, the face of ivermectin has been Pierre Corey and the FLCCC. And he obviously has been on Joe Rogan. He's been on with Brett Weinstein and has become, like I say, has become the face of, of COVID. And a lot of people are looking at him and saying, this is a really brave doctor who's putting putting himself out there and fighting for patients. You've seen some of the the interviews with him. What, what did you make of them? Um, I think I think Dr. Corey, and I don't know him personally. Uh, he's, you know, he's an intensivist. I'm an ER doctor. So ER doctors and intensivists often um, work closely together because, you know, if... Um, I'm often sending patients to the ICU or to the critical care area. So I'm kind of initially managing them. And then I'll, you know, I would tell somebody like Dr. Corey, Hey, I have this patient who's had a heart attack. Uh, and you know, here are the things that we've done so far to him. Um, and this patient's going to need intensive care. They're on a ventilator, for example, afterward. So, um, I, I would say that Dr. Corey seems very passionate. Um, and, uh, I don't think he has any ill motives. I truly think that he believes his, um, his kind of, um, like what he was talking with, with, uh, with Brett Weinstein, he believes his, um, his views of kind of using observational medicine and experiential medicine, his experience for, for as being a nice you doctor for 30 years has value. And I, I fully agree with that. I, I mean, I, um, when, when I also don't know um, kind of the right thing to do, right, because medicine can be really complicated and there's not a study for every single person that has every single issue. Um, uh, that's what we use. We use our experience and we use our best guess and we try and we always try our best. So I, I certainly believe that he's he is um, his heart is in the right place. But I, I feel like he believes the observational evidence way too strongly um, and I do, I guess I do get the sense that, um, that he, um, feels like he's speaking for like a large portion of doctors and, and I just don't like that. He's representing that he's kind of maybe either speaking the truth that like the rest of us have been silenced or we don't feel 
um, safe speaking up or something like that. And that's just not true. Like if you look at Twitter, um, I mean, there's thousands of doctors that will talk to you about ivermectin and, and not be supportive of ivermectin. So I do get the sense that like, he feels like his experience as an ICU doctor matters, but nobody else's experience as a doctor matters that like, we're, I, I'm not sure if it's that we're all like, he thinks we're all, I don't know. He knows the medical system in the United States. So he knows there's no way for like that I would get paid off by somebody for something. Right. I, I, I can't imagine a world where he thinks there's some financial um, sense. I, I genuinely think that he just really supports his interpretation of the evidence um, is that we have sufficient evidence to act right now. And uh, I would say the vast majority of physicians um, feel like that is nowhere near the case and that there are many more ICU doctors that would actually disagree with him. Um, in fact, I, I know lots of ICU doctors that disagree with him. And so it feels like a little unfair that his experience in the ICU and his interpretation of the data um, matters and that the rest of ours don't. Like if we disagree with him, we're going against patients, but that he's the one that's for patients and the rest of us aren't. It, it just, it, that seems a little unfair um, to me. I, I don't know that, I don't think he said it in exactly those words. That's how it feels as a fellow physician. It, it feels like he is, um, he, he, it feels like he, he's kind of like representing that he's representing patients' best interests and the rest of us aren't. And that feels, that's what feels, that's probably the better way of saying it. That's what feels pretty unfair to me that it's like, he's looking out for patients. It's his experience that matters. And the rest of our, uh, rest of us have some other conflict of interest that, that, um, that we're unwilling to disclose, which I have no conflict of interest with COVID that I'm aware of. I want it to go away. Um, I think vaccines are the best approach and I don't think that the data is there for, um, for ivermectin to be sufficiently helpful in that matter, at least for, you know, at least talking today um, in June of July of 2021. The, the strong argument made by ivermectin's advocates is that there, there are these vast financial forces, which is obviously true. There's a lot of money in vaccines. There's a lot of, there's a lot of public health pressure behind vaccines. And their argument is that the research that ivermectin is being deliberately suppressed because of those financial uh, interests. What do you make of that argument? Um, <laughs> on a personal level, I find it a bit bizarre because I'm doing this in my spare time. I'm certainly not getting paid. Um, I, and, and as far as I'm aware, no one has gotten paid for looking into error detection in science. In fact, I mean, error detection in science is one of the most woefully underfunded areas uh, of scientific research, despite being incredibly important. Um, my, my friends and I have been doing this for years and it is hard to, to keep going when everyone attacks you, no matter what you say, uh, and no one is even moderately interested in paying you. I also find th this idea that there's some, uh, financial conspiracy a little bit odd, um, because firstly, I mean, uh, dexamethasone is, is a cheap as chips drug, um, that has been demonstrated to work for covid and has been picked up across the world. Uh, so if, if there was this vast financial conspiracy, you would assume that wouldn't have happened. But also, ivermectin's price has skyrocketed uh, recently because of the promotion um, and because of the, the worldwide, worldwide usage. So if there was some conspiracy, it seems like it, it's good for Merck, who are the primary... Um, the, the primary manufacturers of ivermectin across the world. Uh, I don't know. It just doesn't really make sense to me. So, so this is the key point of ivermectin because it, it fits within this big narrative of there are huge financial pressures, which, is, which one has to say is true. There are huge financial pressures. There is a huge amount of money invested in the vaccines. There is a huge amount of pressure to get as many people to take the vaccines as possible. Therefore, there are m major reasons to, to be um, suspicious that the narrative against ivermectin is in some way generated by that. How, what, how do you respond to that as a, as a working doctor? Yeah, I mean, I, I think 
Um, I mean, if we didn't have such a glaring example that refutes that point, um, I, I, I would kind of, uh, you know, I would I don't know that I would agree with him, but I would, I would see his point a lot more, but like one of the treatments that we use for people hospitalized with COVID is dexamethasone, which is a cheap generic. I mean, it, I, it probably costs pennies to produce, um, and it's probably bought by hospital for multiples of pennies or dollars, right? Um, it has been used for decades as well. I mean, ever since I was in medical school um, almost 20 years ago, it is a pretty standard um, corticosteroid medicine that we use routinely. I mean, I probably prescribe it um, maybe not every shift, but, you know, every two or three shifts. It's, it's a very common corticosteroid that we use for COPD, asthma, um, sometimes allergic, uh, allergic reactions, um, uh, croup, which is another viral um, infection that children tend to get. Uh, and and, it, and it, it showed significant benefit in a, uh, a UK study at, at helping people who were hypoxic, who needed to be hospitalized at, um, you know, with, with COVID. So, and, and I, they seem to always just gloss over that entire, um, that entire point. They will, they will argue that, um, you know, like Pierre Corey will, will frequently say that he was one of the first people to talk about the importance of steroids and that he was talking about it before everybody else was. Um, and, and I think that actually may be true. I think he was talking about a lot of things, um, that he thought were helpful, steroids being one of them. And he may have been one of the first people to say we should give steroids, steroids help. And he turned out to be right about that one. Um, but then he, so he's, he's able to kind of talk about that and take credit for that part of it. But then when he, when it's like brought up about ivermectin being generic and there's a financial pressure that nobody, there's no discussion or like, well, what, you know, nobody asked about, well, what about dexamethasone, which is also cheap, generic, um, effective as well. So that, that feels just, um, discongruent to me to like take credit for, oh, I was one of the first people to talk about steroids and look, steroids were helpful. And then, um, like, you know, a half hour later into a podcast interview say, yeah, but nobody, you know, there's all these financial pressures to push on the vaccine and nobody, nobody will do a trial of a, um, a cheap generic medicine because there's no, profit in it. And it's like, well, there literally is a trial from 2020 that um, we all started, like literally all of medicine started prescribing steroids to these people at the particular dosage prescribed in this in the trial because it worked, even though it was a generic medicine. Um, I also, I guess the other piece that I, um, I take issue with is the idea that there's like, there's no money in, um, uh, well, oh, it's a generic medicine. So there's no money in Uh, in studying it. So maybe in the United States where, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, for-profit drug companies, but I mean, the, 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 the cost and the expense of COVID, especially to countries that have a national health insurance system, or even in the United States where insurers have to pay for, um, the COVID medical care that is worth, I'm sure there's estimates online somewhere of the cost of the medical cost, the summary of the cost of medical care of COVID. I mean, I don't know, it's probably tens, hundreds of billions of dollars, if not trillions. Like, I think there's plenty of of incentive for like the NHS or the Canadian health system or any country that has to pay for all of its medical care um, for its citizens. I think that's worth billions of dollars to like France or Spain or Italy, anybody um, to be able to save that amount of money and not have to spend it. So that argument of like, oh, well, there's there's no money in researching um, a cheap drug. There's only money in vaccines or new cutting edge monoclonal antibodies. That's just not that's not true. Like they've already spent that money. But I mean, wouldn't Canada, wouldn't Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Aetna, France, Taiwan, Thailand, wouldn't any of these countries want to save billions of dollars that they're having to now spend overspend on and delay other types of care that's now getting worse and more expensive as well. So it's just, yeah, that that doesn't ring true to me at all. So just to summarize what you just said, the argument that 
it's all profit motivated works both ways. So it's all profit motivated because you've got big pharma involved and they have their own agendas, but also you then have other big players wanting to save money who would then be who would then be incentivized to to do those trials to find generic drugs. So it's not it's not simply the case that you've got one set of forces pushing in one direction. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. I mean, imagine if um, and, and that's why that's why I said before, I think there are observational trials that um, look promising is the, is the word we tend to use, um, but that this needs to be studied. Um, you know, you could imagine like, say, um, uh, you know, if if France did a trial and show that ivermectin really worked, they would immediately want to give that to all the people everyone in France that could that could take it because it's dirt cheap and it is it magically works for like all those different indications prevention prophylaxis if you get exposed to COVID early COVID late COVID long COVID I mean if it works for all those things you know the economics of it should be that every country should want to buy a ton of ivermectin and give it you know put it in the water supply it's so good obviously as I said I've talked to quite a few doctors recently and the two most interesting counterpoints to that perspective about the influence of money, which is obviously the case. I mean, I think you'd be naive to think that Big Pharma did not have an influence. And we know that from people like Ben Goldacre and his kind of studies of bad science, bad pharma. Um, but the, the two interesting points they make is, OK, you can understand the influence of, of finance in the US, for example. But surely the reverse is true in somewhere outside, for example, the Argentinian Health Service or the NHS or um, the Thai Health Service, they would love to find cheap and effective treatments that they didn't have to buy from Pfizer or from Moderna or all these bigger companies. So the financial forces push in two directions rather than one. Not really. Uh, all of the, uh, you know, the signatories to the World Health Organization, uh, a number around 140 or so. So 140 countries are signed up to follow the prescriptions, which are just merely recommendations. They are not, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say they're not prescriptions, but they're being treated as prescriptions of what you can and cannot do and what doctors in their surgeries can and cannot prescribe. So I do not think it is, it is uh, true, but I think the forces are enormous on country governments uh, not to prescribe ivermectin. And so we need to ask why, because the World Health Organization's very own database shows it to be safe, especially uh, when widely distributed. Mm. And the other interesting counter argument is that one of the most used drugs for COVID at the moment is dexamethasone, which is even cheaper than, than ivermectin. And that went through the trial process. And Dexamethasone is only useful when you're very, very sick. In actual fact, uh, the, the experts are oh God, the experts are saying um, that the doses that have, are being used are way too low, and that methylprednisolone is better. But this is not being heard either because it's been prescribed now that this is what you should do by the World Health Organization. So many doctors in the field are saying that dose that they're saying we should use is too low. Um, yes. Yeah, so in actual fact, dexamethasone is not an antiviral. It is not an anticoagulant, and we know that COVID has got three, there are three things with COVID you need to treat. You need to treat the virus, viral phase, you need to treat the inflammatory phase, and you need to treat the coagulation stage, which is the clotting stage. So all of those three need treatment, and one single drug is not going to do everything necessarily. Uh, all doctors who are, using, who are treating COVID are using combination therapy. So yes, dexamethasone has been approved by the authorities, but, uh, but there's a whole range of early treatments that are not approved, and those early treatments are aimed at preventing you even getting into hospital or preventing you getting infected when, you're, when your family member has COVID. I just want to ask one last question, and please don't take this the wrong way, but I, I've, I've seen it said, so I'd just like to get your response to it. Um, given that the Bird Group is an advocate group for ivermectin, but you're also creating data, the criticism has been made that you're an advocate, you're, you're by definition biased in your analysis. So why, why should people trust your analysis? The Bird Group came after the data. 
So the study was done and it was evaluated the same way as we evaluate World Health Organization uh, recommendations. Um, and uh, yeah, so it came, the bird group came after as a product. It was almost kind of as a mandate of that meeting on the evidence. Um, you know, they said, well, what are you going to do? Now we've all agreed. Um, what are you going to do? So in actual fact, it was a singular meeting initially, the British Ivermectin Recommendation Development Meeting, which has become, a th you know, a thing. Uh, it needn't have become a thing because I just, and we just wanted to hand the information over and get on with our work. It's become a thing because the governments have refused to look at the evidence we've sent them. And so we've had to establish a website and get funded from the public because we have no funding for our work otherwise. And, and we're very grateful for the, for the funding that we've received. So, you know, we have no conflicts of interest. At the moment, I'm earning considerably less than I usually do doing this work. I have, you know, I have nothing to gain except honestly just wishing to save lives and do no harm. And I just want to say, Tess, I really appreciate the, 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 the back and forth and the, the willingness to engage in this because as a journalist, I think this is, this is what's required is to actually have, like I, 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 I'm willing to risk being censored. I'm willing to risk um, if I feel that I've done my due diligence and I've inquired into both sides of the story, then I believe that I'm prepared to kind of go to battle over that. I believe in, in free speech and I believe in open inquiry of ideas. And I think this idea of gatekeeping the conversation, which is what the mainstream is still trying to do, is, is an old model that doesn't work. But on the other hand, I, I also get quite suspicious when I only see people being interviewed by people who don't ask them any tough questions, who agree with them all the time, and that makes me also very suspicious. So I, I, I hope that we can come up with a better way of doing this where, and I, I think having all views at the table in dialogue with each other is, is the necessary thing to do. Yeah, David, I'm so grateful for being on your programme. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. And if you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes. And you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below and we'd love to see you soon.